This presentation is on examination of the normal and injured elbow. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky, Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. This presentation will occur at the ACSM Essentials of Sports Medicine meeting in February 2018 in San Diego, California. This is my website if you would like further information on presentations or publications or links. The anatomy portion of this comes from a chapter that I wrote with Drs. Satterwhite, McCurgan, Strawn, and physical therapist Kevin Wilk. Illustrations by Rich Pinnell. This is a injuries and base book baseball textbook and I think it's a great chapter since I helped write it. But going back to the anatomy, we have to understand the anatomy. The elbow is a hinge joint. You have to understand the bones, the muscles, and the nerves around the elbow and also the biomechanics of the injuries. This shows the bony structures about the elbow. Laterally you have the capitellum, the radial head, the coronoid process centrally, the trochlea and the trochlear groove. Radial head allows pronation supination, the radial neck, the radial tuberosity where the biceps inserts on the lateral or side view, we see the olecranon in the back, the humerus, bowler's angle between the humerus and the distal humerus, radial head, radial neck. If we look specifically at the humerus, in sports, particularly in baseball, we see problems with the capitellum or laterally where when you throw their compressive forces. We see problems in the open physeal plates of medial epicondyle injuries or little legal elbow which is a stress fracture along the medial epicondyle apophysis. The coronoid fossa anteriorly is basically a bit of a concavity where there's a fat pad. So when we think about the lateral view, if we see fat on an x-ray, we know that there is some blood or infection in the joint because the fat has floated anterior. So this fossa does have some depth to it. And then this is a view looking at the distal humerus. You can see this is a spool-like joint very constrained, modified hinge. Looking from the back, so this is lateral, this is medial, where the ulnar nerve runs is in this cubital tunnel, so this is the sulcus for the ulnar nerve. And then you have a deeper than the coronoid fossa, you have an olecranoid fossa that is more deep in the back. Radius radial head, radial neck, radial tuberosity. The articular margin is here. So when we see fractures of the radial neck, we try to move them very early because stiffness is a problem in this hinge joint. What about the proximal ulna? We have the coronoid process anteriorly that can be injured with a fracture, with a fracture dislocation of the elbow, the ulnar tuberosity. And then this is the transverse groove of the sigmoid notch right here. And then on the side view, the ulnar tuberosity, the sigmoid notch, the coronoid process, and the radial notch, and the olecranon. The muscle origins and insertions should also be understood to make diagnoses. These show the muscle origins and insertions anteriorly. And on the right are the posterior origins and insertions. 
I would suggest that you view these in a textbook or online with certain interactive videos to understand the workings of these muscles, origins, and insertions. What about the nerves? The nerves about the elbow are very important from the standpoint of injury with dislocations. We also certainly respect the nerves when we do surgical procedures, whether it's arthroscopy or open procedures. This shows the ulnar nerve. It goes from the anterior to posterior compartment through the arcade of Struthers, which is depicted right here. So here's the ulnar nerve. The ulnar collateral ligament is very close to this ulnar nerve. And oftentimes when we do ulnar collateral ligament surgery, the nerve gets transposed. We must look at the nerve to make sure we don't injure the nerve during those reconstruction procedure. And the ulnar nerve enters the forearm between the flexor carpi ulnaris, the two heads of the flexi flexor carpi ulnaris. And this shows the retinaculum in the cubital tunnel. The median nerve emerges from the pronator teres, as you see here. Here's the median nerve, just lateral to that is the radial artery. The median nerve continues and branches into the anterior interosseous nerve. And here's the radial artery. This is very important when we're doing anterior elbow work, such as repairing of a biceps tendon. The median nerve is at risk and must be dissected. The radial nerve emerges between the brachialis musculature here and branches the radial nerve are shown here and then the very important posterior interosseous nerve and the more superficial branches. This is the arcade of Froch where the posterior interosseous nerve dives. This is a medial view of the elbow showing the relationship of the ulnar collateral ligament and the ulnar nerve. The most important portion of the UCL is the anterior bundle and this is a very taut structure and this is what we reconstruct. There also is a transverse bundle and a posterior bundle, but the anterior bundle is the major stabilizing portion of the ligament to valgus stress and external rotation during the pitching act. This is the lateral aspect of the elbow, very important radial collateral ligament. So a posterior lateral instability of the elbow can occur. Usually it's more with multidirectional instability patients or following fracture dislocation of the elbow. So here's the radial collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, accessory collateral ligament, and the annular ligament, which stabilizes the radial head. When we think about injuries of the elbow or any sensory complaints, you also have to think about some involvement of the neck, particularly with night pain. If somebody has numbness in a certain distribution, you think about a herniated disc or something coming from the neck. And this shows the sensory distribution and what you want to look for. Ulnar nerve here anteriorly shown with the small and ulnar side of the ring finger, C6-7, the median nerve, thumb, 
index, long finger, and radial side of the ring finger, C678, and the radial nerve, dorsal, medial aspect of the thumb. This shows posteriorly the ulnar radial median nerve on the right. So with some of the procedures that we do or injuries that occur, we have to be aware of looking for any numbness in the lateral cutaneous aspect, C5-6. Lateral, lower lateral cutaneous of the arm and do a good sensory exam. After shoulder dislocations, we want to make sure that the axillary nerve, C5-6, is working with active abduction and the sensory deficits would be over the mid-deltoid. The elbow is a joint that we can easily palpate. It's right underneath the skin. You have the muscular origins above and insertions below. So you can palpate posteriorly in the olecranon fossa, palpate the olecranon. You can palpate laterally the capitellum, and also you can feel the radial head, particularly as you go into pronation and supination. Check for symmetry of range of motion. So in this normal exam, ask the patient to move their elbows so he has normal flexion and extension. This is a good way to test pronation and supination. Put something in their hand, and that's full pronation and supination. You can palpate the biceps tendon. This is palpating the biceps tendon, and you should be able to hook around the biceps. There's the biceps muscle, muscle tendon junction. Proximal biceps can also be, biceps tendon can also be palpated, the long head of the biceps. Long head of the biceps, biceps muscle, or the Popeye muscle, so there's the long head of his biceps. So if he ruptures that proximally, you get a Popeye. If they do it distally, then you have a hook sign lost where you can't hook your finger around that biceps tendon. So I'm palpating at the tendon now as it goes to insert on the radial tuberosity. So if you do have a biceps problem or a distal rupture, you lose strength in supination and you can test supination pronation strength, that's pronation strength, test elbow flexion strength. So testing pronation and supination and feeling the biceps. It's unusual for there to be a primary biceps inflammation. Usually it's torn distally and that needs to be fixed. The lateral aspect of the elbow, for tennis elbow, you're palpating the lateral epicondyle where the extensor carpi radialis brevis originates. And so you test dorsiflexion of the index and middle finger and that should recreate pain as you palpate there. So again, you can palpate that area, and that is lateral humeral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Medially, the medial epicondyle, where the flexor pronator origin occurs, you can have what we call golfer's elbow. So that's a medial epicondylitis. Palpate the ulnar nerve. About 20% of ulnar nerves may have hypermobility that may be normal. This is important to know if you have a child with a fracture to make sure you don't injure that if you're pinning a supracondylar fracture. You can palpate and do a valgus stress for the ulnar collateral ligament. So I'm doing this much like we do in the knee for stability in full extension. You get bony stability. When you flex them to 30 degrees, you get more torque or more tension on the ulnar collateral ligament, so I'm testing the ulnar collateral ligament. A lot of action happening in the medial aspect of the elbow, flexor pronator origin, the ulnar nerve, doing a tenels over that, sometimes will produce pain tingling into the small finger. So look at, test the ulnar nerve for mobility and also for any irritation with the positive tenels. And then right anterior to that is the flexor pronator origin, and then deep to that is going to be your ulnar collateral ligament. What about the back? This is a lecranon bursa. Normal bursa should have the skin crinkle up like that. So this is the tip of the olecranon. And this is the soft spot of the elbow, just anterior to that. So if you have a, an effusion, you will feel the fat pad there, and you may be able to tell if there's an effusion or swelling in the elbow. 
and that's where we would do an aspiration of the elbow right through that soft spot. And then when you examine for ulnar collateral ligament injuries, have them be lying down, um, supine. Do this in zero and 30 degrees of flexion. So I'm palpating his ulnar nerve, and then I'm applying a valgus stress at the elbow. Examine the normal, and then go to the injured side. And this is a bounce home test. If they have irritation with an olecranon osteophyte, or if they've lost extension, that will cause them pain where the olecranon goes into the olecranon fossa. He has excellent five degrees of hyperextension and basically a normal elbow exam. So know your anatomy, palpate the olecranon, olecranon fossa, and in throwers oftentimes they'll have a positive bounce home test associated with osteophytes in the back and ulnar collateral ligament chronic injuries. You can also do a moving valgus stress test that can be done supine or usually done seated where you do basically an arm wrestling maneuver from 70 to 120 degrees seeing if that reproduces their pain and if that is the case then they have had an ulnar collateral ligament injury. You can also see flexor pronator strains and in that case you'd have more pain when doing manual muscle testing of forearm pronation and flexion. So what about lateral, this posterior lateral instability, which is very unusual. So this is what you do to test for posterior lateral instability, axial load and external rotation or supination of the forearm. If they have that, oftentimes they'll feel a clunk. Sometimes they do have Marfan's type syndrome or ligaments are hyperlax and they may be able to voluntarily do this, ask them if they can recreate the popping and so axial loading. So it's basically like a reverse pivot shift for a posterior lateral instability of the knee. So this is our seated exam. So rotator cuff problems typically radiate and cause pain into the lateral deltoid. You can look at their posture. Uh, deltoid, again, if you had an anterior dislocation, you want to make sure you check sensation. Have them move their neck around and see if there's any reproduction of upper extremity tingles, tingling. Check their scapula. Elbow problems, oftentimes there will be scapular dyskinesis or a shoulder problem. When you have them standing, you can examine them for symmetry of alignment. This is an excessive valgus, but it's normal for this individual. He hasn't had any fractures. Sometimes you can get a cubitus varus from a supracondylar fracture, or this is called a gunstock deformity. This is an individual after he had a supracondylar fracture. He has this left gunstock deformity, which ideally should have been treated operatively initially. Osteotomies of the distal humerus can be done. It's not as much a functional problem. But this is a gunstock deformity that we don't like to see because we like to treat supracondylar fractures with reduction and pinning. So with that introduction about anatomy, bones, muscles, nerves, and exam, you can understand how using your knowledge of anatomy with detailed history, including mechanism of injury, you can arrive at the correct diagnosis. We haven't even done any imaging yet. You can get a good sense for what the diagnosis is even before the x-rays in baseball, for example. Obviously with a fall, you need to make sure there's no fracture. And MRIs have given us a much better appreciation of some of the soft tissues. Compare the normal to the injured side. Do the normal exam first, then the injured side. And if you think there is something that's going to create pain, try to do that as a last test. Thank you very much for your attention. My website is myname.com. Look up other presentations or information on this website.